it's weird. Cancer has really like impacted my life negatively, obviously. And, but I would say it also gave me my start uh, on the internet. So in, in that way, I guess I should be, I guess I should be thankful. Welcome to Log Off. Everyone has an internet story to tell. And today we're getting Andy Isaacs. Andy was one of the first people I saw grasp the power of video on Twitter, quickly turning around sports highlights on his account at World of Isaac, which gained him tens of thousands of early followers on the platform. He's also a master of online food discourse, having popularized the gluttonous Fatterday trend on social media, in which people post their cheat day meals every Saturday. And his snack reviews during the pandemic were appointment viewing as far as I'm concerned. His food exploits and complaints have also earned him the title Sausage King of Detroit, which I'm sure we'll get into. Most importantly, he's one of my very best friends. Our bond started online, it strengthened while working together, and it has blossomed in real life. So it's a pleasure to finally welcome him to log off. Andy, let's start this podcast the way we always do at the beginning. What is your earliest internet memory? So <laughs> first, I'm glad that you mentioned that we were um, that we're friends because I, like I really wondered how people would be like, well, how did you um, how did you meet like Andy and stuff? So, yeah, I mean, yeah, full disclosure, we're actually very good friends um, yeah. and we've known each other for a really long time. And we had, you know, it's funny that we both kind of started on the Internet separately Um kind of at the same time, a really long time ago. Um, To answer your question, I think (laughs) I'm older. So I, in the 90s, there were two different ways to connect to the internet, right? It was Prodigy and AOL. We weren't in AOL household back then. We were Prodigy. It's really weird to think about. This is like the house that I grew up in when I was little. We ended up moving, you know, like in the mid 90s. But I remember using prodigy before that which is crazy we're talking about maybe 92 or 93 and at that time on the internet there was nothing right even geo cities didn't exist on the internet geo cities was like the first like i can make my own like website right and so like at the time it was just like you could play games online you could look at like the weather there was like some news but it was very I, I would I would venture a guess that there were only a few hundred websites available in 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 the nineties, like up until maybe like the mid nineties. So I would say that was my first real like introduction to the internet. And then I I went to college in the in the late nineties, and I would say that's my second real big introduction to the internet. Um, I was lucky enough to have, I took a computer with me to, um, to college and a lot of other people just weren't as lucky, right? They would have to use like computer labs or whatever. So my computer, the computer in my room basically became everyone's, um, computer. So people like I would leave my door open and everyone on the floor would use, um, would use my computer. And so now we're talking late nineties and people were using it for, yeah, like they would check their email, but they were also looking at nefarious type things. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'll be totally honest, because we're friends, I'll, t- I'll tell you the very first big viral video on the Internet is the Pamela Anderson video. And people would come to my room and watch the Pamela Anderson video on my desktop computer. And I'm sure it did a number on my computer and that computer did not last more than like two years just because of all like the viruses and stuff that that came about. But it's um, those are my two probably biggest memories of the computer uh, of like the Internet. And I can't believe I'm mentioning the the Pam Anderson <laughs> video, but it, it, it was a I different imagine, time back then, right? Different time back then, man. I, I just imagine when it was time to get rid of that computer, someone coming with like a biohazard suit on and, and removing it from your room. Oh yeah, that thing was nuclear. That thing, that thing was so radioactive that uh, I'm pretty sure someone got cancer um, from that computer. Man. Okay, well, I was going to ask, like, what were the first things you started consuming when you really got connected to the internet? I guess after the Pamela Anderson uh, tape, what what kind of stuff were you browsing around looking at? Yeah, so I mean, 
I, it's hard because if we're talking about like the real early internet days, my mm-hmm. the biggest thing I think, and then this was for a lot of, I think, high school and college kids was Napster, right? So yeah. it was it was so easy to just, and I'm sure like uh, I'm, I'm beyond the the scope of getting charged for downloading like music and stuff, but it was such a big deal in college to download music. And you have to remember, we were all on dial-up internet. So even the noise of the dial-up internet gives me PTSD. Like I can still hear the noise of the modem it, like in my head sometimes. And so we would download overnight um, in college at like four or five megabytes, like a second. So you would maybe get a few songs like overnight and you would build your library. And um, I mean, over time, I think maybe like two, three years after that, we were introduced to Ethernet, which was like the difference between dial up and Ethernet was was monumental. It was so, so different. I mean, it was I, I'm trying to think of a, a comparison between dial up and Ether. It, there, there is it was it was like night and day. Like the, the internet was just like, and that's when the internet boom, I, I think really happened when the speed of the internet increased and yeah, man, it was a long time ago. Even the email I was using in college wasn't even a web based email. It was like a telnet, right? So it was like they, their own like private, like email system. And it's just, wow. I like, I can't believe how much the internet has changed pretty much in my entire like adult life. Um, just everything has has gone from like zero to like 200 um, in, in that time. Yeah, we really are the sweet spot, right? Like we remember yeah. the world before the internet and now we've seen how much it changed. It's it's pretty crazy. Changed for um, the bad, probably. Yeah, I think there was like a bell curve, like it was changing for the better and then it's like <laughs> and now it hit a point where it all went downhill. Oh, wait, what's the rating on, on this podcast? Is this an R-rated podcast? Do whatever you want. It's fine. Right. We already talked about sex tapes five minutes yeah. ago, so you're good. I'm gonna say let's let's hope the kids don't don't listen to this one. They'll be like, "Who's Pamela Anderson and what's what's her what's her tape about?" You're like, it's not right, me. So, <laughs> not me. <laughs> it's a little different from that. Yeah, yeah. There Great is show, water the activity. There is water activity. <laughs> um, so that kind of covers uh, early consumption. When did you actually start creating and putting stuff out for yourself? The best way to describe it is um, I didn't really start posting on the internet. Like I posted on like on message boards and stuff, but like my creator day really started um, in late 2006. You know, um, unfortunately I was diagnosed with, with Hodgkin's lymphoma in late 2006. And the best way to like keep people, like keep my friends like apprised of like my treatment and what was going on was to start a blog. And so at the time, it was very easy to start a blog um, like on, on Google. It was just like blogger.com. And I had a blog spot address and I just called it. I couldn't really think of a name. So I was just like, this is about my life. And I was like, let's just call it, call it World of Isaac. And it was worldofisaac.blogspot.com. And I kept that from, I think, late 2006 And then, you know, it was really just, hey, I'm just telling my friends what's going on with treatment, Um, you know, with just like a like, you know, humorous stories, whatever, like what happened in in treatment, whatever. And then it kind of like at the end of, you know, I was I was done with treatment like mid 2007. And I was like, all right, do I just quit this this blog or do I just I keep it running? And, you know, (laughs) At the time I was getting like my friends, like the the comments under my blog were like, there was like several hundred comments and it wasn't just my friends anymore. It was like other people who had, who had found the blog. And so I started writing about other stuff. So it's weird. Cancer has really like impacted my life negatively, obviously. And, but I would say it also gave me my start uh, on the internet. So in, in that way, I guess I should be. <laughs> I guess I should be thankful for uh, uh, for cancer for for giving me my 
I don't know if I would ever, I don't know if I would have ever gotten into the internet. Um, maybe like down the line, but I got into the internet early on. You know, you have documented that your cancer fight openly online up until, yep. you know, current day. And you've had an army of people rooting for you, myself included, every step of the way. Has that has that been therapeutic for you to kind of like give people updates and, and get that feedback? I would say there are a lot of times where I think it was very helpful um, for me to write about and talk about having um, having cancer and just kind of like the treatment that I was going through up until I think even when I had a a stem cell transplant in, in 2009, I think probably it's been a little more difficult um, the last decade or so to update people because I think it's been a lot more complicated. And um, I think there are a lot more like questions. And, you know, I think a lot of people look at Hodgkin's lymphoma and they say, oh, that's a good cancer to have, right? Hodgkin's um, historically has been um, a high uh, cure rate, you know, 85, 90%. I just happen to be one of the unlucky people that, you know, did not get cured first time or or with second line treatment. And, you know, now I'm on like 30th line line, line treatment. So it's, I think it's been a little more difficult the last few years to try to explain um, what I'm going through. And, you know, I think um, the stories aren't as positive um, the last like few years. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of ups and downs and there's a lot of treatment that looks positive and doesn't work. And, you know, I, I am generally a very positive person, so I don't think I wanted to kind of give people, hey, this is the the really shitty part of of having cancer for a really long time. And, you know, um, I think one of the sad things for, for me is a lot of the people, you know, I used to be in these cancer group chats, you know, speaking of like the Internet, there were a lot of these like cancer message boards, um, especially like in the 2000s, late 2000s. 2010s, whatever. And, you know, you befriend a lot of like the other patients. And, you know, sadly, a lot of the people that were diagnosed at the same time as me or had disease at the same time as me have, have passed away. And it sucks, man. There's a lot of survivor's guilt um, involved in, you know, living just, you know, living for so long with the disease. And, you know, I'm lucky. I'm lucky in that yeah. I haven't run into a very, very serious issue. I've run into like, hey, I have a blood clot or hey, I got an infection. And, you know, that's how a lot of, um, a top, sadly, that's how a lot of cancer patients end up dying. They don't die from, from treatment, right? They die because they get pneumonia or, you know, like they get a blood clot and it just sucks. And, you know, like, it's hard for me. It's hard for me sometimes to to go back and, and think about all the, all the friends that I've lost, um, you know, over the last 15, 16, 16 years. So yeah, rest in peace to all those, all those people. Some of them were real warriors, man. They went through, they went through a lot and were able to survive a lot and just unfortunate circumstances at the end. Yeah. It's incredibly unfortunate. I, I imagine on the the flip side, there are people going through that now that maybe find some inspiration from your story. Do you hear from people like that? Oh yeah, I um, you know, just because I I think I've been so open, especially on Twitter, I can tell you that I get a lot of messages um, from patients, not just Hodgkin's patients, but other cancer patients on Twitter. I do my best. I I try to keep those pretty private. I do my best to try to like talk to people just about you know. I I think. Right when when people have cancer, they just sometimes just want to talk about how angry they are, or like they feel like they're you know been they have like this the short stick in life, and they just want somebody to listen to them. And um, you know, I I've been going to a cancer clinic for a really long time. This the same one since since my transplant in two thousand nine. So I know a lot of the you know a lot of the patients in there and a lot of a lot of older cancer patients, they're just, they're miserable. And, you know, sometimes they don't have the same support system and they just, somebody, they just want somebody to listen to them. And, um, 
you know, thankfully, I have always one of my good qualities is I am a very good listener and I'm always willing to listen and I'm always willing to talk to any cancer patient that has difficulties or they just want to vent uh, about something. So, I mean, that that's the good thing, I think, as part of um you know, having a presence online is that, you know, some people feel like they, they can reach out to me and talk to me about anything. And I am, I am okay. And I am very like approachable, not only like online, but like in person too. Yeah. That's one of the things that initially drew me to your Twitter account is just, you're very personable. You can tell it's a real human being behind there, not a, not a facade. And I mean, even yeah. to today, you're very prolific on social media. What Kind of, I mean, we've covered like why you started your blog and stuff. What finally pulled you into social media and posting so frequently on Twitter? So I'm trying to remember when I think I I had some reservations about posting on on Twitter because I thought it would take away um, from my blog at the time. And so, like for a lot of us, the blog was the way for us to like reach out and kind of like gain traction. Um, but then, you know, Twitter comes along, 09. I think Facebook has had probably already been around at that time. So I um, I branched out, I think, to Twitter in maybe like 2010. But mostly it was just like, hey, these are links back to, you know, what I was doing. Um, so there was a lot of, hey, like, I just want to kind of get traffic back. And if people want to comment, they'll comment on like the blog or, you know, at that time. So like. 2009, um, I moved from a blog and then we started a men's site called, called Gaiism. And so like, I was trying to just traffic people back there and not as much, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Like talking about who I am on, on Twitter, as much as I'm still kind of keeping my personality elsewhere. But obviously, I mean, and you know, like social media kind of takes over and you're, your brand kind of moves away from like your, your personal blog or, or whatever. And, you know, I think that's <laughs> so what a lot of publishers are, are dealing with now is that, you know, they can't get traction on, on social media and people want to talk about issues or talk about stuff, but they're not talking about stuff on, on your, on your website. They're talking about it on social media. And yeah, Twitter's still our comment like, sections, comment yeah. sections used to be where it was at or message yeah. boards. And now they're just, they're wiped out. Wiped out mostly because uh, it got ugly on <laughs> some of those mm -hmm. comment sections, right? Yeah, especially the ones the spam bots took over too. It was oh just yeah, like I remember you could you could um, use like Facebook comments um, yeah. and like attach <laughs> it to your um, to your site, and that became like disastrous, right? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, like, I'm sure we can talk about like social media and just like how much it's helped, but man, it is pretty much destroyed um it has destroyed digital media um it has okay. destroyed like publishers and you know on top of that now we have all these like crazy search stuff going on and ai is likely going to kill anyone's like search anyone's seo on their site is going to get destroyed um in the next few years and that's it's the shitty part of, and the evolution of of digital media yeah, why do you need a website to answer your question when AI will do it for you? It's it's yeah. really hard. I yeah. mean, that's a lot of those publishers are banking on people come to us as a source and we know how to game the SEO to be at the top and it's it's gone. Yeah, I mean, part of what I was really good at was gaming was gaming the system and mm -hmm. figuring out how to get people, you know, to you know, at, at first it was guyism, then it was, you know, obviously uprocks and was very good at like figuring out how to get them there. Now I'm like, I'm not smarter. I'm not smarter than the, the AI, <laughs> right? Like I'm smart, just not, <laughs> not that smart. So I, I don't even, I don't know what the future of digital media even looks like two years from now, even yeah. a year from now. But I mean, it's, it's, it's bad. Um, mm -hmm. Sucks. Yeah. We're all beholden to the platforms, playing the platforms games. It yeah. feels like forever. Do you remember the first time you really had like a pop or something go viral? That's a good question. I, I've i had so many things go mega viral to the point where memes are recirculated like with my tweets pretty often. 
Um, <laughs> I have one just from a few years ago where I was, I think I was making fun of, um, it's one of the Kardashians or Kylie Jenner or something. And she had become, a, um, she was very close to becoming a billionaire. And um, people started donating to her to get her to billionaire status. And I think I said something like, um, we're like the worst civilization ever, or like this is the lowest point in our civilization. And like that, that tweet, honestly, I don't remember how, how long ago I made it. It gets recirculated all the time and it got recirculated like two weeks ago and people kept texting it to me. They're like, Hey, I saw this on this meme Instagram, or I saw this on this meme Twitter. And I'm like, man, yeah, it's been around for, for such a long ass time. Like I, that like in internet years, that's like 50 years old. Right. And so I don't know if that's like the, really like the first, very first thing. Um, but it's probably the, the, the biggest thing I had a lot of, a lot of my videos, especially during COVID, the snack review videos went like viral and I had like several hundred thousand views. I really wish Twitter was um, monetized at the time because I probably yes. could could have retired and I probably would be in a yacht talking to you instead of my my stupid office at home. So yeah, I, um, I really wish I would have done things a little differently, but it is what it is, man. Uh, so you... You were posting about food for quite a while before the whole Fatterday thing exploded. What made you start using the Fatterday label? I, I really like people have asked me what's like the origin of Fatterday. And I, I really I, I'm not sure I actually remember what it was. And it was just like something that I started like going out to eat a lot on, on Saturdays. And I was like, oh, this is like my cheat day kind of thing. And I don't know if it was somebody else who mentioned it to me. Is like not Saturday, but like Saturday, and I was like, "Hey, that's like, that's like a genius idea, like to go on." And like, it really is. In the first few years, it was a big, it was a big deal, right? It, mm-hmm. Like, it would trend on on Twitter, and you know, I think I became kind of like, um, especially like in the area, in like the Detroit area, I became a, like a go to for, hey, here are like places in Detroit for um, for people to eat. And I think it gave people an excuse to, you know, post their like food pics and, and whatnot. I, I, I'm i definitely like not a pioneer. <laughs> not like other people weren't, you know, posting like food stuff. I just think I had like an interesting angle and, you know, people gravitated toward it. Yeah, you're really good about using your platform to shout out local restaurants, but um, mm-hmm. some of them have to be better than others. So give me your top five Detroit food spots starting with number five i have eaten at so many different detroit spots over the years like i i have kept like a spreadsheet of places that i i've gone to and sometimes it doesn't get updated um i mean but it's like several hundred um that i've been to i would say like my favorite ones right now i'll go down my list one is a place called um Taqueria Lupita's. It's this cash only taco spot, Southwest Detroit. I think some people are are familiar with it. It's just like very simple. They they do tacos like really, really well. Al Jum's barbecue. It's a halal. So I mean, I, I live in like the Detroit area, right? You know, there are a lot of Arabs um in the Detroit area, a lot of Muslims. So halal barbecue is a big deal, right? Um, no pork, right? You have to prepare it a, a certain way. There's a lot of good halal barbecue spots. Al Jum's it is probably my favorite. He makes a brisket sub that is outrageously good. Ooh, it's probably awesome. one of the best things I've ever eaten. And like, I'm talking about like worldwide. I'm talking about like places in Italy and Spain that I, I've eaten at. I, I really think I would put that sub up against a lot of things that I've eaten. There's a slider place <laughs> that I really like um, going to. Um, it's actually by my house called Hunter House. It's just one of those places I I enjoy eating alone. And I think when you're like a food reviewer and somebody who enjoys food, you have to you have to enjoy doing that kind of stuff by yourself because you can't always find people. And, and honestly, sometimes it's not it's not worth your time to have people because they can distract you and, and whatnot. So I have eaten alone at a lot of places. Hunter House is great because I can just go sit up at the counter, eat my sliders, eat my chili cheese fries. Um, so that 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 place is is probably like my favorite and probably the place that I go to the most. 
Speaking of Arabic, I go to a place called Hamido. Um, they make shawarma sandwiches. I obviously I'm Egyptian. I love um, I love Arabic food. I love shawarma. This place just does it so well. I have tried almost every shawarma sandwich. I would say in southeastern Michigan, so like in the Detroit area, and I've like ranked every single one. That one always like comes up on top for me. The last one is a place I think Tony would like. It's a Euro place called Mitsos. I love. I mean, shawarma and and euros are like brother and sister. Um, this place they just they just do the bread so well, and it's just. It's a newer place, probably like two years. It's just, it's amazing. Best Euro I've had probably outside of Europe. Uh, you seem game for top five. So let's rank some other foods you cover pretty frequently. See if we can sure. stir up some controversy. You have a meticulous Blizzard ranking you regularly update. Give me the top five Blizzard iterations you've ever tasted. I would say I am the world's foremost authority on, on Blizzard. And like, I realize I'm giving <laughs> myself, I'm giving myself that title, like, I, I'm sure like I have been called the sausage king for for obvious reasons. Um, but I am mostly the the blizzard king too. Like I have tried every blizzard Dairy Queen has put out, maybe except for like one. And those are like the specialty ones that they like come out with. And and it, honestly, the only reason I didn't go is because like I wasn't feeling well, was in the hospital, something, right? Um, my favorite blizzards. Hold on. The fact that I have spreadsheets, Rye, of just different <laughs> rankings of food. And people have seen my Blizzard ranking before because, like, I keep it, like, I, I keep it in this, like, special sheet. And people will DM me, be like, hey, I can't find your, your Blizzard ranking or something. So my <laughs> favorite Blizzards. Here we go. Reese's Outrageous. It's a specialty um, Blizzard. It has, like, peanut butter. It has the Reese's. It's essentially, like, a take five in um in a blizzard but for some reason they call it the reese's outrageous not available because it was like a special item they probably will come back with it again the heath and i know people are going to be like heath is a shitty shitty ass candy bar and i don't disagree but when you put heath with ice cream the toffee from the heath and the crunch make it honestly the best Blizzard they have that they have like continuously, like the one that's always on the menu. Royal Oreo, I would say Royal Oreo should still be on like most um in most uh Dairy Queens. It's an Oreo Blizzard, but like it's different, like because the Royal, the Royal um Blizzards like they have like the center, which is really good. Oreos are sh- are a shitty cookie, but they're so good with ice cream and they're they're so good with 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 blizzard so royal oreo uh peanut butter puppy chow was amazing and i Mm -hmm. this was yeah this was something i think that came out last year probably one of their best um new blizzards i don't believe it's part of their regular menu but i mean we're talking about like peanut butter like chocolate the texture was really good there was like a good crunch it was pretty good um i specifically remember being a Dairy Queen and seeing that on the board and texting you to ask for your review before I ordered it. Yeah, so, hold on, I'm looking thank at Thank you. Thank you for the rec. So I have one, two, three, four, five. There are five blizzards that I've ranked in the nines, and uh peanut butter puppy cow was 9.0, and the Reese is outrageous 9.2, and all the other ones are like 9.1. My last one is a mix, and it's kind of cheating, is a mix between Heath and Butterfinger. And I think it's because like the Butterfinger has like the whatever, like the, the peanut butter and like the toffee. It just works and it works with the vanilla ice cream. So all of these are like the vanilla vanilla based ice cream. It doesn't a lot of these flavors just don't work with the chocolate because I think it it makes it almost like too heavy. I don't I don't know how to explain it because you're you're trying to get the chocolate from whatever flavoring they're they're putting in. And when you already have chocolate ice cream, it just, it's just like overwhelming. That's like, that's like the fat person's view of, of blizzards. <laughs> like you can't, you can't use chocolate ice cream. You have to use like the vanilla ice cream, right? All right. Since you have the list out, why don't you skip to the bottom? What's the worst blizzard you've ever tasted? So, and this is speaking of viral videos. I would say this is one of my bigger viral videos was Dairy Queen for some reason. I don't know if they let like a toddler in their like test kitchen, <laughs> but they were like, hey, let's try Sour Patch 
candy in an ice cream. And it was called the Sour Patch Kids ice cream. And it was a limited time flavor. And it was, the video is somewhere online. I don't know if Elon Musk um, deleted it. It's somewhere online. It was so, like, it is a one bite type, oh my God, what the hell did I just put in my mouth um, type thing. And I rank, I gave it a point two, and it wasn't. It was like it was a zero. I couldn't, in good ganjas, like tell anyone to even try it. It was so bad. I remember one person saying, "Well, I mean, if you like Sour Patch Kids, I'm like, no, Sour Patch Kids and ice cream don't really. It's not a good like combination. Even if you're like a, even if you're a kid, I I don't, I I didn't I didn't get it, and I think it's. The second worst thing I've ever, I've ever eaten. Um, the worst thing I've ever eaten, um, and this is another viral video, was root beer peeps. And this was like during COVID and I was trying a lot of snacks. Root beer peeps is, I, I wish I could describe just how bad, like even the smell of the root beer with that marshmallow was horrendous. And almost vomit inducing. I remember like I tried not to throw up on, on camera um, eating it. And I had eaten a lot of bad peeps. I had eaten uh, watermelon peeps. I had tried like maybe like 10 or 15 different kinds, but root beer was, was definitely, was definitely the worst. All right. If you're going to name the worst snack you tasted during your uh, snack reviews during the pandemic, you have to name your best one too. So what's the best thing you've tasted? My, I think the highest thing I've ever rated in my snack review is probably my still to this day, probably my favorite chip. And it is the voodoo heat from Zaps. So Zaps is like, um, I think it's a New Orleans company. I'm not, I'm not sure. They have something called voodoo heat and it's an extremely like hot, um, like, you know, like a red um, type chip. But it's crunchy because it's like that kettle um, chip. And I, th- I want to say I gave it like a 9.3. It's the best to this day. I still think it is the best chip out there. It's the best, one of the best hot snacks um, out there. And yeah, I, I like I that video was was pretty lengthy. And there was a lot of like back and forth with with people, you know, saying this is the best chip. This is the best chip. No, I I'm firmly in the camp that. The voodoo heat is is the best, is the best, definitely the best hot snack and probably the best chip out there. You're also an M&M fiend. Uh, you've reviewed yeah. more iterations than I even knew existed. Give me your top five M&Ms. You tell me first what your favorite M&M flavor is, and then I will give you my top five. Peanut butter till I die. Peanut butter? Yep. Yeah. Not I peanut, like, peanut butter. Yeah. I... And you, you like if I guess if you followed me enough, you would know that I'm very, I'm very um, a peanut butter and chocolate type of person. But my favorite, um, my favorite M M&M and M for sure is peanut. It's the peanut M M&M, and M, and it's probably peanut butter number two. Um, nice. My number three is the fudge brownie which just came around like maybe 4 or 5 years ago fudge brownie is extremely good um despite being like maybe having like too much chocolate but i i really like it man um four is one that you can't get in most places um they sell it like in texas and i think like southern california new mexico it's called jalapeno uh peanut and i think it's I don't know if it's like um like a Latin like Mexican um type thing um but it's really only available like down south I the only way I got it was you know when I was reviewing a lot of snacks people would send stuff to me like in the mail people would send me snacks like that were you know like to the like you know that they had in like their area and that's the only way I I've been able to get jalapeno pin and I was really mad he sent me maybe like five bags and I tried to keep it as long as I could. And I think I lasted maybe like two or three weeks, like max. I, I'm, I'm a sucker for M&M. Like it is very hard for me to turn down 
an M&M. If somebody has it, even if I'm like not feeling well, if somebody was like, hey, hey Andy, you want some M&Ms? I'd be like, I'd stick like five or six in my mouth, like right away. No, no, like no question. Um, last one I think is that I still like the regular milk chocolate M&M. That would be like my, num- my number five. I do like the, the mint um, M&Ms. Um, but I, I think that would probably be like a, a six or seven. I, uh, I just tracked down the M&M's Mexican Jalapeno Peanut Limited Edition on eBay. Do you want to guess yeah. how much a set of four packs is going for? So four pack, just like the regular like share size or like the, the smaller size? It looks like shares, share size, yeah. Four shares. I'm going to say for four, I'm going to go $52. It's 125 Oh, my God. Yeah. What? Right. What we need to do is create a business and we need to create a knockoff jalapeno um, peanut m M&M. <laughs> because clearly it's in demand if they're selling for, you know, whatever, 25 bucks a pop. That's outrageous. I, oh, okay. I think you need to go back to people sending you snacks and then just sell them all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was it's great, man. Um, for a while there, like I couldn't find um, Topo Chico. People would send me Topo Chico. Ah, uh, Topo Chico. Um, was- I have a Topo Chico like problem. I the grapefruit Topo Chico is honestly the best drink um, out there. I tried to replace it. You probably saw me drinking Fresca. It's, it's not the same. It's the grapefruit uh, Fresca. It's not the same as as grapefruit Topo Chico. It's just it's much harder to find now. Do you drink and, the hard Topos, the uh, margaritas? No, I don't. Um, I don't drink Delicious. really anymore. Oh, I haven't. Like I, I might dabble like here and there, but um, I, I just, I have so many problems that like even one drink bothers me. So yeah, I don't, I don't go into the hard Topo Chico and I'm not even sure it's good. Um, I don't know. Like I've heard It's like, fine. If you're like watching things. a movie or something, it'll give you a nice little buzz while you're drinking a sweet yeah. seltzer. But that's why I use edibles. <laughs> Uh, all right, top five fast food items. You've got quite an extensive collection. I don't even know, know if you have a spreadsheet there, but I do. I, <laughs> I mean, I, I've probably stayed away um, from fast food like the last few years, but I mean, I spent a very long time eating a lot of fast food. Um, this is a, probably a controversial list. I have the curly fries from Arby's. Ooh, yeah. um, the curly fries from Arby's are goaded. They. It is so like it has the right amount of salt and that it has the right amount incredible. of like crunch and, and texture. It's the best, the best fries. I know people will say that, you know, um, Chick-fil-A has the waffle fries, but I'm like, no, the, the curly fries has has never let me down. Um, the chocolate frosty from Wendy's, and yes, I get it. It's just soft serve ice cream. You can get soft serve ice cream, but I swear that they put drugs in that and the chocolate frosty from Wendy's. There's some, it's either cocaine. I don't know if there, there is some kind of drug in the, in the chocolate frosty that makes it better than any other place that serves like soft serve, right? Perfect texture um, too. I am. I'm very particular about fried chicken. I eat a lot of um, chicken wings and, and fried chicken. It's very hard for me to say that, the, that there's anything better than the Popeye's chicken sandwich. Um, Chick-fil-A has very good chicken sandwich. Wendy's is a good chicken sandwich, but none of it is better than people who have been frying chicken for a really long time. And that's, that's why Popeye's, when it came out, it was such a a big deal. And even to this day, when I try to go get Popeye's, there's always a line out into the street and it's obnoxious, but it's whatever. Um, the last two things are things that are not around anymore. And one of them I have been very vocal about is the chili cheese burrito from Taco Bell. The chili cheese burrito was Taco Bell's best menu item. I don't care what anyone says. Like, I understand cheesy gordita crunch, all like these, the the, the newer ones. Um, but the chili cheese burrito was, it was like, it was perfect, man. It had the right blend of like cheese. And yes, it was very regretful the next day or the a few hours later, but it had the right, the right blend of cheese and like salt and it was just smooth. And I, I love, I'm so mad. 
I don't understand why Taco Bell, and I have written to Taco Bell before. I have sent them emails. I have tried to get it back. There was one, every time, like every once in a while, somebody will be like, hey, this Taco Bell is still carrying chili cheese burritos. And then I'll go and I'll ask. They'll be like, no, we don't, we don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, what is, is this like some kind of like, like fifth <laughs> dimension thing that I can't get the chili cheese, chili cheese burrito. And it's sad, man. I, it's probably the best discontinued fast food item ever. It really is. Um, I don't know if you have ever had the chili cheese burrito. I don't know if they, they carry it in your neck of the woods, right? But it's, oh. it's such a wonderful, it's such a wonderful thing. I've had it, and whoever's in charge of Yum Brands should be hanged for taking yeah, it off the menu. I, I agree. Let's hang, tar, <laughs> tar and feather them. I, I don't know. Um, my last one is, and I think you're not as old as me, but you you probably remember. McDonald's fries in the 80s tasted mm-hmm. significantly different than they do now. And yep. I've, t- I've talked about this before on, on a podcast, but... They used to cook McDonald's fries in beef tallow, which is like beef, like essentially just like beef lard, beef fat. And um, who was it? Who's the funny looking uh, dude with the podcast? Oh, Malcolm Gla- Gladwell. Right. The dude with the <laughs> okay, yeah. weird hair, right? He has a whole podcast dedicated to talking about the McDonald's fries and why they they changed because they they're good now. Not nearly like when they were when we were kids, it was amazing to eat McDonald's fries. It was it was better than it was better than the burger it was better than like the Happy Meal it was better than the Big Mac. It was just it was so good. It had this like it had this flavor that you it hasn't been matched. I mean, it's essentially you're saying they cook it in probably like canola oil or vegetable oil now, but it, the the beef fat gave it just like this special. <laughs> Special flavor. I, I miss it. I wish they would they would go back to it, man. Yeah, it's wild that it's still like probably a top five or ten item regardless, yeah. but it used to be so much better. All right. I have one more top five for you because I'm really curious what number one is. Top five Dorito flavors. I am also a sucker for <laughs> I am a sucker for a lot of things, and that's probably why I'm fat. But um <laughs> I it's hard for me to say the the number one if I if you put a gun to my head and made me choose one, I would say it's probably salsa verde. Um, it's, I think it's more readily available now than it was maybe even like a year ago. Um, the packaging is like green. Um, it has cool ranch, um, type, um, like texture, you know, like with like, like the seasoning is still like on the chip and you can see it. So it's like a, a lighter chip. Um, it has like a little bite to it. Like it has a little, has a little kick. Um, I would say that's probably if, if you put a bunch of Doritos in front of me, I'm going for that one first. Tapatio, which is also one that you can only find maybe Southwest in, in the Southwest, Texas, California. Tapatio is, it's the, it's the hot sauce on um, the Tapatio hot sauce um, in, in Doritos form. Excellent. That's probably. I would guess that's probably number two. Um, they came out with one, and I don't know if you've tried it, Rye. It's called like late night loaded taco. The 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 bag is like black and like purple or something. It's similar to salsa verde and that like you know uh, heavily seasoned has that like southwest type flavor. I would say that's like number three. Uh, spicy sweet chili, great. Fantastic. It's um good, like sweet and hot at the same time. And then you can't talk about Doritos without talking about like the OG. The OG Doritos is still yeah. a top, what is it? Probably like a top 10 snack. Um yeah. it's hard to say no to Doritos. And I, I was talking about this with a with a friend recently. Like it's one of those things where if somebody opens up a big bag of Doritos, you could easily see yourself eating half of it. And like, not even like the only thing that would stop you is that you have the, uh, you have like the nacho fingers and you have to like grab a napkin or something. That's, that's the only thing stopping you from eating a whole bag. 
That's what your pants are for. Just wipe them on your pants. Yeah. That's, that's exactly why all my clothes smell like nacho cheese, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is a legit, though, Pavlovian response when you hear a bag of Doritos open and your mouth just starts watering. Oh, yeah. Like, I have to have a handful of those. Yeah, that's like the it's like the, the fat guy. It's like the fat guy calling. Like when the, you know, you ring, you ring the bell, like for, for dinner or something, you open up a bag yeah. of Doritos, all the fat guys, all the fat guys come out, man. I think it's just a, I grew up in the eighties and nineties yeah. situation. We're, we're definitely dating ourselves here. Totally. Uh, I guess we have a little bit of a game brewing here because I found the Tapatio Doritos on eBay. Uh, do you want to guess what a, a four pack of, it looks like the little bags is going for i've never even 10 ounce bags i'll be honest i've never even seen the tapatio in a little bag so on ebay whatever 10 ounces 9.75 ounces yeah so those are the those are the bigger bags um okay so a pack of four how about i'm gonna go 82 dollars 41.79 that's actually that's not bad the thing is tapatio i mean at least i can find tapatio at the store, I wonder if it's just some regions get the Tapatio. If I go to like Detroit, if I go to Southwest Detroit, where there's a large Hispanic community, I can get Tapatio pretty easily. Um, but yeah, maybe not as much like in, in the suburbs. I, I People are missing out. Have you ever had the Tapatio before? No, I haven't. I'm, right, I'm tempted gonna, to buy them. Maybe, maybe you should be uh, going into those neighborhoods, buying them up, and put them on eBay. I well, that just makes me want to just send it to you. So I, I'm making note to to send to you guys um, later this week. <laughs> it's really good, man. That works. Have you had the salsa verde before? No, I haven't had that one either. What the hell? Where do you? I live? was wondering where, where you live that just like nacho Doritos. Are you not a fan of the uh, just the nacho cheese Doritos? No, no, I am. I I just don't. I, I prefer a little more spice um, with my snacks, which is why I think like, you know, like the, the voodoo, the voodoo chips are like the best one. I do. I love the, the nacho cheese. I just prefer, I think those, those other ones, but I'm kind of surprised that you've never had um, some of those other ones. So wait, so they, you're not getting the loaded taco late night ones. Cause I thought that was readily available for everyone. They might be available and I just mm. haven't had them. Uh, this is the green yeah, bag, right? Get, no, so the green bag is salsa verde. The loaded taco late night is like a blackish purple bag. I only found actually I found oh, that when those. I was in North yeah. Carolina um last year. I was in North Carolina for like probably like six weeks. And it's fun when you live when you live somewhere else or you go somewhere else, you find like what what people like in like that area. And so that was it that was that was fun finding out like different snacks and and different like cuisines that that people prefer. Anyone who follows you on Twitter knows you're a huge Detroit sports fan. I'd say it occupies probably what 90% of your tweets at this point. Um <laughs> yeah, I would I would say I yeah, would I say feel like I know way too more. much about Michigan State basketball too because of you. Um, yes, that exactly. online celebrity seems to have bled into real life too. What's it like, like making real life friends based on your sports alliance and and being recognized in public too because of it? Yeah, I mean, I have like I have made some like very good friends um, through my through my Twitter account, um, like like friends that I you know hang out with outside of like Twitter and stuff, and friends that I can like count on. Um, being recognized is a little weird. I'm not, I'm clearly not a celebrity, but people treat me as, as one. And it's weird because like, I don't do anything. I'm just a person on the internet that makes videos and I might review food and, you know, I make people laugh and I, you know, I make people smile, whatever. So getting recognized is not something that I have gotten used to. And, um, I've gotten recognized in really, really weird places uh like i've been recognized when i was like in europe um one time i was on the road to hana mm -hmm. which is a, a spot in maui um kind of like a secluded spot there's not a lot of people and i was walking into this forest with a bunch of like cool looking trees and some guy was like what's up isaac and i was like totally threw me off and i'm like there's maybe like 10 people here. Like, so that was, um, getting recognized is, is something that takes some getting used to. Um, 
I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people believe I'm approachable, which I am. And that's why they're, when they see me, they're like, Hey, what's up? And I'll always like stop and and talk to people. I think because I'm just like, I'm one of them. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the common man. So, um, you know, they, they want to chat about the lions or, you know, they want to rant about the pistons or, or whatever. And I'm always, I'm always willing to, to listen and yell about sports with, with people and, and food with people. So yeah, you're, you're one of the more positive people I know when it comes to sports fandom, but you're also pretty critical of certain players, coaches, executives, whatever. Um, does that ever backfire in real life? Do you bump into people like that? I'm trying to think, um, of a time. I mean, I, I'm definitely very critical of the piston and what sucks about that is I sit right behind the pistons bench. Um, I see you on league pass. Wife. Sometimes I'll zoom in. I mean, like there's Andy. Yeah. Um, the coach's wife sits next to me <laughs> at the games. Um, because, because I'm behind the bench, that's where, um, players, families sit. So I've learned to kind of tame um, what I'm saying. Um, but there was, and I'm not going to say who it was. I, I did get into it with, um, uh, a family member, uh, last year, possibly like the year before. And I tried to ignore, ignore her, um, because she was upset because I had just, the Pistons are a very frustrating basketball mm-hmm. team. And the current, this current Pistons team ownership it's a complete disaster. And for someone like me who has been watching the Pistons since they were, they were a kid. I mean, it's, we're talking about a, a franchise that has had a lot of success and to see what it is now, I was there, you know, like during that terrible, like losing streak earlier this season, it's just like, what are we doing? And it's so frustrating, but yeah, I've definitely, that was a really bad interaction I had. And you know, thankfully that person isn't around anymore because, you know, uh, the regimes have changed, but yeah, I, I'm trying to think of another time. I mean, I I've ranted more, I think about the lions than I like the past regime of the lions with Matt Patricia more than I have, uh, about any other team because it was so frustrating. And, you know, speaking of viral videos, I have one where I ranted about Matt Patricia and this was like in front of my house and I was screaming so loud and yelling so loud that people were walking by my house. They're like, what the, what the hell is going on? And I mentioned it like in the video, I'm like, people are looking at me. I don't fucking care. Right. Like I, um, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, I've avoided really bad, um, interactions with people every, every so often I'm at a game and you know, somebody has something mean to say, but like, it is what it is. There's a lot of, there's a lot of crappy people out there and there's a lot of people who just are mad that you're maybe like popular or that you have a following and stuff. So yeah, I, I've tried to limit those kinds of interactions, but sometimes you can't really stop it. (laughs) So we've, uh, we've established your food passion and your sports passion those things kind of culminated with you gaining the title sausage king of Detroit. Can you go into how that moniker was earned and how you had to like the literal red carpet laid out for you? Yeah. So there was, so at little Caesars arena is where the Pistons play in downtown Detroit. Um, by the entrance where I would go in, there was a, like a hot dog, like concession stand. And it was called the sausage house. And it was, they had sausages from a local brand, um, a local company called the Dearborn brand. And they're like the best sausages, the best like hot dogs. And for some reason during Pistons games, the place was never open. And (laughs) it got to a point where I would take pictures, right? It started because I started taking pictures in front of the the sausage house and it was closed. And I was like, what are they doing? Like, this is the, this is clearly one of their best concession stands and it was always closed. And part of it was nobody was going to Pistons games because they suck. Right. Because the Red Wings also play at little Caesars arena and they would be open during the Red Wings games, but they wouldn't be open during Pistons games. So 
it became like a thing, right? It became like a meme was me standing in front of the sausage house um, when it was closed and like the lights were off and people would come take pictures with me. It was like, it was really like a stupid thing for probably like a year or two. Um, and then like a few at the end of, I mean, this was like two seasons ago, at the end of the season, my ticket rep, and I feel sorry, my ticket rep took so much heat because it was, it became a really big thing and it got back to the organization and it got back to, you know, the people who run Little Caesars Arena. Like, what does this guy, what does this guy want? Like, why is he <laughs> creating such like a, like a headache um, for us? And I'm just like, Hey, like, and they, they would send me messages to be like, Hey, just, just open it up. Like, it's, it's really not a big run. not a big deal. And then one time it was open. I couldn't make it to the game. And I was in the car when, when people were sending messages, like, Hey, what's not just open? Are you coming? And I'm like, and I was like, really, really pissed off. But anyway, so, um, two years ago, ticket rep came, you know, she was, you know, I think she's trying to put like a positive spin on the whole thing. They gave me like a thing that said, um, you know, uh, free sausage house for a year for the sausage King. And, um, that's, that's kind of like, I think where, where it really started, I think probably people were calling me the sausage King before that. And I hope that it had to do with hot dogs and sausages and not anything else. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so that's how the whole sausage King thing. And then what sucks is they give me this, this year pass to get sausages and what happens the next year right they're they're barely they're barely open um i think the one time that it was really open i bought like 200 dollars worth of uh of sausages for for people and then the following year they closed the sausage house which is fucking ridiculous and i could probably spend an hour talking about how i think they personally did it like i think it was like a personal like slight to me um, I think they were like really just sick of like the amount of attention it's got. They put a Coney Island there and that Coney Island just sucks. Like, it's not like their chili cheese, like dogs are like anything to like speak about. Like it was a fun thing for an organization that was really shitty. And so whatever I, I've tried not to like, I've kind of moved beyond the whole sausage house incident. And I didn't even renew my tickets for the Pistons next year, mostly because I'm upset about, the whole like ownership and the the direction the team is going but the sausage house definitely the closing of the sausage house definitely played into it man not renewing your tickets when you've lost the sausage yeah. king you've lost all of detroit i think honestly if if i could if i could do it again i would probably get tickets to the lions instead the, the mm. whole thing is that going to basketball games requires some kind of like commitment um, we're talking about like 40 games a year. And so, I mean, I also just wasn't able to go to as many games, but I love my favorite sport is basketball. I love watching basketball in person. And I think a lot of people know me mostly be because of the lions and, and food, but like basketball has always been my thing. I used to listen to basketball games with my dad as a kid. I listened to the bad boy Pistons on the radio, you know, because like they were on a, like a special paid for like network and, you know, like, and we didn't have a lot of money like when when I was a kid. So we would listen to a lot of a lot of basketball games. Um, so it's really I mean, I don't really want to get into too much, but like it's really sad what the Pistons have have become. And they're basically like a laughing stock. And the the losing the losing streak this year was really was really hard to like watch as as a fan and, and somebody who cares about like like the organization and the history of the, of the team. So yeah, it's, it's left a bad taste in my mouth, man. Hate to hear that. He gets at some amazing glory days too. I mean, it'll bounce back eventually. I would hope. I mean, like at Rye, we're talking about they haven't won a playoff game since I want to say like 2008 or 2009. So that's still like, uh, like Chauncey rip type days. Right. That was like a long ass time ago. And the NBA lets so many teams in the playoffs. I know. And they've only made the playoffs, I want to say, like once or t twice since then, and they haven't won a game. And it's just, it's really, the team needs to be sold. I mean, there needs to be a pretty big overhaul just like in management and stuff. I, I was just at a game, right, um over the weekend, I think on like Friday. And I just like, I can't even really like bring myself to get angry 
just because they're they're so bad and there's I mean you, you want to love Cade and you want to love Jaden Ivy yeah. and you know they have a lot of young talent they just they're not putting it together and it's a coaching thing it's a management thing it's an owner ownership thing and they probably all need Bonnie it. Williams give the money back all right. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's get into some of our uh, uh, dumb internet Seriously. questions we ask everybody. Um, you already stepped on this one, but uh, Andy, sure. how many uh, tabs do you have open right now in the browser of your choice? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to count one, two, three. So I have 18 open on my desktop right now. And I'm not even talking, I'm like on my phone. I don't know how many I have on my phone, but my guess is it's probably in the, in the 40 range. But on my desktop right now, and I would say that's 18 is probably like normal. I have an automatic, um, you know, like when you open up your Chrome, I have an automatic and it's automatically set to like eight or nine um, things that I have to see like every every morning. When What's I in up. those uh, have oh, yeah, to see 18. tabs? It's like your email. What else is in there? I have two for email, one you for Slack. Slack. In, the, in the browser? Um, I wow. obviously have, yeah. Okay. I mean, I have Slack on my phone too, um, but I prefer to use it um, in a browser and not the desktop one because of the pings from the, the notification. All other ones are just like, I have like my WhatsApp open. I have my messaging like apps uh, open. I have Twitter I have Instagram open. I know like people are like, why do you have Instagram open on desktop? But sometimes it's easier for me to keep up with like messaging and stuff from Instagram. But yeah, like nothing. There are some like food things opened up. I have Discord um, up for something. And the rest are just spreadsheets okay. and just work Fair. nonsense. Um, when you open your social media work. apps, what are the algorithms feeding you right now? If you can disclose it. <sighs> and so <laughs> I think a lot of people, if, if people follow me, they probably know like my Instagram is is full of a lot of animal, stupid animal videos and um food videos. The last few days, so this is weird. At the Pistons game, um, I go with one of my buddies and he's like, Hey, um, I'm thinking about going to Italy um this this summer. Um, like what do you because I've been to Italy like twice and he's like what do, what do you think so I started talking to him about like food that I liked in, in Italy and I particularly love Florence and ever since then so that was Friday ever since then Rye I have been getting like here's this mortadilla sandwich from this small like little little cafe in, in, in Florence so I'm getting flooded with food from Italy and it's really just like I think we've talked about this before. They spy on us and they spy on us so much to like, every time I talk about something, I know that I'm going to see it on Instagram, uh, on Facebook, whatever, um, just like the next day or even just like a few hours later. So that's what I'm being fed. I'm being fed the normal dog, um, stupid videos and a lot of Italian food right now. Are you going to book a flight to Florence? <sighs> I don't know if I can do um, Italy again. I was just there last uh, like fall. I need to find a different place that has equally as good as good food, man. Well, there's always Olive Garden. Uh, favorite accounts to follow yeah. on social media. Favorite accounts. So, <laughs> there's <laughs> there's this one Instagram account I follow that I absolutely love. I, I want to say it's called <laughs> King Chili the Pug. And it's this dog, particularly like they have different characters for the dog, but one of the dog's uh, characters is Derek. I, and let's, I am going, full disclosure, I watch a lot of these videos at night after I take like my sleeping, like medication, which involves, you know, taking like edibles. And so a lot of these videos may not be as funny as I'm making out, but I swear to God, Ride this dog named Derek cracks me up, and you know it's just like a voiceover. They, they they show the dog, but the voiceover with the dog's face, I don't know why. I it makes me laugh so hard to the point where like I think 
like my wife thinks there's something like wrong with me. She's like, it can't possibly be that funny. But I swear to God, to me, it is like the funniest, the funniest thing. And then there's also there's also this fat bulldog. And I don't know what the name I want to say his name is Floki. It could be like a woman's name. But this this bulldog or pug, it's like a really fat animal. And they make the weirdest like barking type noises. I, I'll have to send it to you afterwards, but it is it's called like Floki the the pug in Vienna, the Dash Hound is the name of the account. But this really proves that I waste a lot of time um on my phone and i watch a lot of dumb things on my phone how much happier would we all be if only dogs could have social media like if that was the only content we could consume yeah i would be at, at least 75 percent happier as a human being i'm guessing it's a dog but what is the last thing that made you truly laugh online the last thing i don't know why this just came across and i've watched this video a number of times and I'm sure you've seen it. It's the video where this this guy's in a parking lot, and I don't know if he's the this other older white man thinks he's um he thinks he's like trespassing or something. So they're like arguing, and the old white guy says, "Hey, what's what's your name?" Because like, what, like, what's your name? I'm gonna like you know report you, and he says D. And the guy goes, D what? And he tells he's, he says D's nuts. It's my favorite D's nuts video. It's probably like the one thing if the internet, and I know you asked me, if like the internet disappeared, I want this video because it has made me consistently laugh for at least five or six years now. And I'm sure people who are who are gonna listen or watch this podcast know what I'm talking about because the the guy's face, the older white guy's face is like in the background when he says D's nuts. And it's just, it's just a, such a perfect D's nuts setup. And uh, just, it's beautiful. It is, it is internet art. It really is. All right. For those who haven't seen it, we'll put a link in the description for sure. Um, okay. Let's get into the dark side. Uh, what was your most scarring moment on the internet? If you can bring yourself to disclose it. <sighs> scarring moment. I uh, stupidly, I mean, listen, if you're on the internet long enough, you are going to stay and do stupid things. And I, I've been on the internet and I'm older and there are videos of me, like there are thousands of videos of me online. But the one thing that I think that I've probably gotten the worst feedback on is I once stupidly said the Pistons had a better future than the Milwaukee Bucks. <clears throat> and I have not deleted that tweet. And that tweet <laughs> comes up almost every time the Bucks are like successful. So I said it the year and then like a few months later, like the, the Bucks won the, the, the championship. Um so, oh, so course, this was like, after they drafted Giannis and he was winning MVP. This is after they drafted Giannis. So, so it's before the Pistons had had um gotten Cade. So, like, the Pistons had Killian, they had drafted Killian, Sadiq, and Isaiah Stewart. And I really had, like, I really believe that the Pistons were kind of going in the right direction with, with Troy Weaver, right? So this was, like, his first or second year. It's a dumb thing to tweet. And, you know, I pr should probably delete the tweet, but kind of, it's kind of funny now because it does come up every every so often. I, I would say a majority of Bucs fans absolutely hate me. And that's fine. I like, listen, if you're on the internet long enough, you are going to say, and you're going to say something you regret. You're going to do something you regret. And if the thing that I regret is a stupid tweet about sports, that's probably not that. That's probably not that bad, but it is it caused me a lot of just like a lot of angry DMS, a lot of, you don't know what you're talking about um, type of stuff. And I, I get it. Yep. I, I totally understand. How do you uh, pry yourself away from devices or log off? Do you have any special tactics that might be helpful to others? I really wish I could. I am very much tied to my phone, um, as I'm sure you are. I don't have any. I don't have any tips. I listen. Even like the one thing that I really enjoy doing is that I do listen to a lot of um, audiobooks um, on my phone. And, but that's still like, I'm still on my phone. 
Um, but I really enjoy like walking and listening to audiobooks because it really like kind of helps me get away from like like the whatever's going on, like the stress of work or or whatever. Um, I really find enjoyment in in like listening to audiobooks. But again, the audiobook is tied to my phone. So I don't know if that's really if I'm really like disconnecting. Um, I would love to say that I read, but I don't really read anymore. Um, I mostly just listen, listen to books. I consume, I consume it better, um, listening than, than, than reading. So yeah, I don't, I, I wish I had something profound to say, but I, I don't know how to tie myself. I don't know how to get away from, from, from the internet. It consumes my life, man. Do you consider um, listening to an audio book, reading a book? Because that's a constant fight between Allison, my wife and I. She says yeah, it doesn't count I, when I listen, but I think it counts. Yeah, no, I think it does. I think we're on the same page. And I think I've talked about it with AP before too. Um, it really is like, I think it's more about like how you consume things. I am much better. Like if you ask me to read a page and if you ask me to listen to a page, I would be able to almost recite word for word um, from the audio, but I can't retain information as well um, reading. And that's kind of how I've been like my entire life. I read a lot um, when I was like in, in high school and probably like in my 20s, uh, but I've moved more to like audio. And I really do think it's, I, I just think it's a different way to consume, but I do think it, it, I, I, I'm in the camp of it's, it's reading. It's reading just in a different form. I agree. We're reading all day. It's just another way to consume the stuff. Yeah, man. I'm on the, look like we're talking about how many tabs I have opened. Freaking eighteen tabs. I don't want to. I don't want to have to read. A, like a, it's a good enjoyment for me, man. Not trying to get in a reading contest. I read twenty thousand tweets today. I think I'm gonna. Yeah. No. Seriously. Okay. Um, any uh, audiobook recommendations? Since we're on audiobooks. Um, I am currently in, and I'm, I'm this kind of lame. I'm currently in the the Bosch. Um, series from Michael Connolly. So Those are I books? really like. I thought that was a TV series. It's both. It is a TV series, but it started out. So Michael Connolly is a very popular writer, right? He is. Yep. He wrote the entire Bosch series. He's also Lincoln Lawyer. I think people are familiar with, which I think also became a TV show. the 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 um, TV show is fantastic, and um, our friend Brian will will kind of back me up on here because we were both pretty big um bosch watchers the great thing about the audiobooks is that a lot of them are narrated by the guy who plays bosch on tv because and i'm sure you do the same thing for audiobooks i have to get this like i have this like picture in my head of of what's happening so for me it was a lot easier when it was somebody i could recognize so seeing seeing titus welliver like in my mind and then having like hearing his voice for the audiobooks was like like very like it's like it brings me a lot of like joy to do that i for me like it has to be a good narrator or i'm not i can't get into like the book the narrator isn't good it is really <laughs> really hard for me to to get into so that's what i'm listening to mm -hmm. right now every every so often i will get into historical stuff i've listened to um a grant auto you a grant autobiography uh i have the the elon musk autobiography but i can't bring myself to listen to it just yet um the Barack obama autobiography was really good um probably one of my favorites is this is kind of funny matthew bacane had an autobiography that was fantastic it was called like green lights or something it was one of the better and I think his voice has a lot to do with it. Like it, it just became something very easy to listen to. If somebody is like monotone and, you know, like they, they don't know how to like kind of inflect their voice. It just, it's becomes a very hard thing to, to listen to. So yeah, the Bosch series is what I'm in right now. I'm almost done. I think I have like three more books um, locked there. Okay. Uh, where would you be without the internet? Nowhere. Hell. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, my guess is that I would probably still have the job I had before I got into like digital media, which was like in, in finance. And that would be such a miserable existence because all the people I know that work in finance are miserable human beings um, for the most part. And 
you know, making money for like if you're a financial planner or whatever, making money for other people is just like kind of just sucks. Yeah. Um, the whole financial thing is, is kind of shitty, but like I think that's probably what I would be doing because that's you know that's what I knew but like before. I don't know. I mean, I'm very happy, and I'm very glad the internet came along because I think it gave me opportunities I would never have had. I mean, I think that that goes for like the both of us. Um, but I think we're trying. We're seeing like we're seeing the downfall of of the internet in, in general and we're seeing all the bad things and we're seeing how bad ai can can be and we're seeing the deep fake stuff and the misinformation on the internet is truly probably the worst thing and i don't know if we can get out from from under it but yeah not to be totally depressing but yeah i don't i don't know where i would be the without the internet and i'm glad that it's given me opportunities but i, I think it's for mankind um you know the internet social media has, might have like an overall negative impact well let's say it mercifully went away tomorrow what's the one thing you would want to save i want to save that d's nuts video man <laughs> you have you seen the original <laughs> have you seen the original d's nuts video um it's a guy he calls up his friend and he says Hey, something the, something came in the mail for you today. And the friend, you could hear the friend go, what's that? And he goes, D's nuts. And he just starts laughing. Sadly, that dude just passed away like last year. You know what I'm talking about. It's like. A, Is that the got him guy? He yells out got him yes, afterwards. Yes, it's that guy. He he died. Yeah. Like, it's I want to say like last year or something. So that was, that was kind of sad. But yeah, I'm taking, oh. I'm taking those D's nuts videos. I'm taking all the, the dumb dog videos. <laughs> with me um if if the internet blows up man <laughs> fantastic answer all right let's close on that thank you andy for this discussion for your contributions to the internet and for being my friend in real life this is ryan perry saying log off the internet will still be there when you get back <laughs> <laughs>